In his 87 years in Belize, Thomas Green has rarely lived beyond the high water mark of the Macal River. He probably knows this eight mile stretch between San Ignacio and his home upstream as well as any man on earth. And he ought to. He's paddled and poled this spectacularly scenic route as regularly as most city people drive to work. And while those urban commuters pilot vehicles assembled in Detroit or Tokyo, Mr. Thomas, as he's known, prefers to build his own. He's crafted over 40 of these rugged yet graceful dories. They start as towering mahogany, cedar or guanacaste trees. And with a little help from a saw, axe and adze, are transformed into transport. At four score and seven, how does he do it? If you live a good life, you have to have a certain amount of faith or confidence in, a, in of your own self and try to learn the good or the bad. The bad side, if you, let's say you, like now I, <clears throat> I could work with an ex or an edge whole day. So not charm, you know, do nothing. But uh, with the machine, I can't do it. The machine to chop the whole day with the machine, and I not used to that. But the ads are the ex that could work the whole day. <laughs> you see what I mean? See the difference? Doing work that suits him has taken Thomas Green on a course that flows not only through the center of Belize's majestic forests, but through the nation's history as well. From rough and tumble mahogany camps to mule trains laden with chicle. And as today's economy expands to embrace environmental tourism, Mr. Thomas, now much in demand as a guide, is going with the flow. I go on the river and I keep on working on it, and I get a living that way. But sometimes you meet birds or different animals that you see, you explain to them, and from some time well, you tell them about the time that they, they, when we used to pull and paddle, the, the, the channel then change, and just like that, anything that you, you know that you experience or you have an idea of it, well, then you explain that to them. Some of the time they ask questions. And the one question Thomas Green has no trouble answering is whether he has any regrets about the life he has chosen. And like uh, here, you know, got no you know, got no nice, no trouble, nothing. We have to live more uh, peace of life, tranquil. You see? Nobody worry you with nothing. You don't have to hear too much noise and fight to row or nothing. So that you live, you could live your life this way. But if you're in at the tongue, you're in at trouble because sometimes you're sleepy, sometimes you're out the out in the night. No, because you want the old, but you meet with your friends and you definitely from one thing to another. You all the time you get home late. <laughs> you don't get to right rest. I do believe it's a gift. For more than half a century, Hortense Robinson has been healing the sick, using little more than what grows on trees. When she learned her craft, traditional healers represented the familiar face of medicine in Belize. But with the growth of Western medicine, local bush doctors were relegated to the position of mere quacks. Their remedies and methods were seen as unsophisticated, superstitious, having no basis in scientific fact. Now the knowledge that has been passed down from generation to generation is enjoying a rebirth thanks to stalwart herbalists like Hortons. Raised in Mexico, she lived among the Ikaiche Indians, learning much of what she practices today. How I learned to walk and talk and everything among the Indians then, that they brought out from Ikaiche to San Francisco Bautis. 
and they are where I start to learn these remedies from home and um, from the Indians them. On link to technological breakthroughs that have advanced Western medicine, traditional healing's main boost in the 20th century has been its survival. It has lasted because its secrets have been preserved in the heads of practitioners like Hortons. And I'm a child that, if you say, well, let's go collect herbs, we go with the people in collecting herbs. And to each herbs I said they collect, what you want it for, what you will do with it, what you use it for. And they keep telling me, they wasn't selfish. This is the wandering Jew, Eric. It seems an unlikely combination, but Hortense's daughter is a trained midwife. So mother and daughter work at either end of the same field. Ancient and modern medicine live, not always comfortably, under the same roof. It was difficult between me and her then, before. But when she realized that we need both, we need medication from the doctor, we need advice from the doctor because the doctor, they are trained, they are certified on what they do, and we sure of what we can take care of. And I think both should be together. Though Hortense is prepared to wave the white flag at modern medicine and work alongside rather than against, she does take pride that few of her patients have needed a second opinion from a more conventional doctor. And up to now, I only knew one person that really had to take an operation after using the heart, but it was too far gone for both um, cure from the medical doctor or from herbs. While Hortons cultivates some of the herbs she uses, others she still has to collect, out in the bush or by the side of the road. Everyday plants that most of us trample underfoot are to Hortons a cure for sores, the symptoms of tuberculosis or skin cancer. However, as Belize develops, much of the lands where the herbs grow is being leveled for real estate or turned over for farming. So we go and ask permission to go in the land before they clear it and collect the baby plants and have somewhere to preserve it. Just as many people sneer of the old before profiting from their ears of experience, yes. people are now beginning to open their eyes and see beyond the novelty of modern medicine. They have realized that there is a reason why certain things have stuck around for so long. Salaman! Salaman, yeah. And me, Salaman Brown, married to ride again. Then I wrote on Kutung Kutung. It's called Rock Down Music, and there is no one more closely associated with its performance and preservation than Wilfred Peters. While other kinds of popular rhythms come and go, Mr. Peters and his boom and chime band play on and on. It's not known exactly how Brockdown music came into being but most people trace its roots to the mahogany camps of the 19th and early 20th centuries, when small groups of rugged men working for long periods deep in the forests had to make their own entertainment with whatever instruments they could muster. Well, see, when I start, they would have um, you know, like a car for slug. They'll have dance and so maybe you have a car jam, a boom drum, 
و هست جابو نسا انا گفت ول نایت زن لی ول مگر نه پانسو تا پوتی تا یاسا به نویس انا گفت ول نایت نه تنا پیو پیو ام وایت روم نو کوک انا نه وده رواتا و و این دات دی وایت روم از بتا دانو ودیس تن هاو دو بای فینگی تاپ ما وقت مانی Shalai baby, and I shall I pick me, find your pick me daddy, it I shall I baby. Mr. Peters is no stranger to getting up for work in the morning. He still earns a living as a carpenter and does a bit of farming. But there's no question about what comes first in his life. Yes, I love it very much. <laughs> Which in the kind of the land pan was name, like this. This is Mother Night with a small yellow girl, if I like. Small one. I love this kind of. Yeah. Run, Mr. Peter, run. Run for your life. Do, Mr. Peter, run. Uncle Bobby, we come. Listen carefully. Hear me carefully. It's not a good thing, my friend, to keep another man wife. Hear me carefully. Man, I think it's very good to be with you now. Plenty good. Because it's him. Um, it brings back so many old um, memories of all the people I used to. You used to pay, you know? culture things. See, young man, you call it a punter or a calypso. Most of like, you know. But the other people, they usually call it a rock drum, rock drum music. It would be wrong to say that young people don't like rock drum music. It's just that they're not exactly beating down Mr. Peter's door to take accordion lessons. Yeah, I'm willing for him help them learn it also, but they got to play cassettes. I'm very interested to play the big box, boom, 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 yeah. But not this. They don't interest it. They said, when I'm gone, well, I don't know who to take over. <laughs> you know? I don't know. I spend all my time weaving. I don't worry to go nowhere but sit down in my house and do my weaving. It's a pleasure to me. As clay pots give way to Tupperware and homespun cloth to synthetic fabric, less and less do the traditional crafts and materials touch our lives. Ironically, because they are so rare, these skills are now revered as precious and a vital part of a community's identity and culture. One of these skills is weaving, a craft kept alive by the nimble fingers of 65-year-old Jane Williams, who has almost single-handedly battled to keep her art from being elbowed aside by the strong arm of mass production. When I was at school, I make the basket out of the fermenter leaf, sell it every Saturday to buy my books, exercise, and so on, to go to school. Taught to weave with palmetto, Jane has since changed to coconut palm, readily available in Dangriga. Harvesting the palm fronds with her machete, she fillets out the spine collecting the brown needle-like leaves for weaving. It was no fermenter at the present. So the good Lord said, try the coconut leaf. Then I get up, I have a tree in the yard, pull the coconut leaf, I say, oh, you see it right there now. And I start to work on it. And I complete my hat. Jane's craft is not part of a culture just because it is a traditional way of making ends meet. Perhaps also adorn the heads of celebrants in the most important event in the Garifuna calendar, Settlement Day. They buy all the hat from me before the 19th of November. That was the hat that we wear to go to church and parade with it. Yeah. 
On November 19th each year, Garifuna people from all over Belize and abroad head home to Dangriga to remember the day when, as free people, the descendants of African slaves and Carib Indians landed on Belize's shores. Some came in small boats, some of them walking on the sea beach, and when they reached with this river and they taste it, it was fresh. And they say that this was the country, that this was the place they are going to stay. And they call it Dangriga. Though the Garifuna are conspicuously proud of their heritage, Jane regrets that the old culture and language is dying out. We have to blame ourselves because we're supposed to teach our children our language. It is not just the language that is standing still. Despite her efforts to get the younger generation into weaving, few have taken on the skill. If the art of weaving is not passed on to the younger generation, then Jane Williams will be one of the few people surviving who can turn a palm in her fingers into a work of art. The advice that, that I want to give the youngsters to try and learn a trade for themselves. Because this trade now, it keep me alive, keep me to feel younger. The big guns, they're forging, you know, big guns. Harder punishment for you. Where perhaps you will get five years, they give you ten if you, if you commit yourself to come back. But we don't expect you to come back. We don't have time to, to hang up too much. He makes his way slowly through the dimly lit cells and corridors of the Belize Central Prison. Despite the weight of his 103 years, Michael Nemhart walks easily without fear among the thieves, muggers, and murderers. A retired teacher turned prison chaplain, he doesn't make the 20-mile trip easily, but he makes it just the same. You don't want an easy life because you have the easiest life you can have is to be here in the prison. But you will be outside uh, where you would have to have the responsibility as a man. And to remain here all the time, then you see, you kill your manhood. Sir Nemhart. All right, sir. Quiet. Sir. You are reminded of it sir. when your case come up. Nemhart believes that one of the greatest problems facing Belize is its men, or lack of them. Many are absentee fathers, depriving homes of a masculine role model. Like father to son, Nemhart instills the pride of manhood, even in those who have made mistakes serious enough to land them in jail. I figure that I've been going along and, uh, and tried to sow the seed and uh, try to, to sow as best seed as I can possibly sow. This seed was made in the prison over there by one of the, the inmates there. Born in Jamaica in 1891, Nemhart first came to Belize, or British Honduras, in 1923. He has taught all over the country in a career spanning 70 years. After an epic working life, Nemhart is still enthusiastic about his chosen field. To me, teaching is not a job. Teaching is a profession and a calling. If I, if I had to begin my life over again, I, uh, I think I would, I would do teaching. Very much to, see you. Very much to, see you. to 
to straddle a hundred years with one foot in the 19th century and the other at the end of the 20th is no mean achievement. To still be helping the young at an advanced and usually fragile age is not only remarkable, but inspirational. I have at my home, there are two old machetes. I haven't used them. And they stay there and rushed out to nothing. Just rushed out. And I show my children, and I show people who come. I say, that's how we become. When we just stay and do nothing, you just rushed out. And it's remarkable how rusting it's remarkable how rusting can get you down fast. 